Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Globon. It's International Artists Day. Tony, who are your favorite artists? Tony Kornheiser, Matt Painter, Ron Artest, Drew Bledsoe. You get that Drew Bledsoe? You like yeah, that? that one right over my head, that one. I thought you were going to come up good. with something completely, you know, esoteric. I, I was waiting for something, you know, some what, show like off fancy English major thing. Formerly known as Prince? Well, that would have been Remember better. That? I like the that. Formerly known as Prince? Yeah. yeah. Well, I know, because you, you like Prince a lot. I love Prince. with Prince, weren't you? Love Prince. Parties at his house. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, could Aaron Judge end up a Dodger? Are the Spurs better off winning or tanking? And Brian Windhorst joins us for five good minutes. But we begin today with your Bears, Wilbon, going yeah. into New England and putting a beat down on the Patriots, 33 to 14. The Bears were trailing 14 to 10 in the second quarter after Mr. Bailey Zappi replaced Mac Jones and led the Patriots on two touchdown drives. But Zappi's star faded a bit with a fumble and two interceptions. And the Bears scored 23 unanswered points. Wilbon, you were convinced yesterday the Bears would lose this game. Yep. How yep. do you explain yep. what happened? Tony, they got better. I mean, they had a mini buy for coming off that Thursday night debacle and loss at home to the Commanders last week. They got better. They worked at it. Justin Fields said after that game, I'm tired of being close because the Bears have been in every game. They've been in the games. Maybe one they weren't in, but they've been in and they've won two. And he said, I'm tired of being close. I, I want to win. I want to win now. And I liked when I heard that. I didn't think they were ready to go to New England and beat Bill Belichick. But, Tony, they were better. That was Fields' best game. That team seemed to rally around him like they really liked playing with him. They seemed to like their coach, who seems to make adjustments and has gotten better at adopting things. They ran the ball more. They played to Ooh. their strengths more. They did not have you know, too many crazy penalties like they did previously under the other regime for Matt Nagy. They got better. Now, I don't want to get crazy, but this was a big, 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 big step forward. Big. Wow. I don't know if it's just Look one game, Tony, Look but I you. love the way they played. I was excited last night. You're, you're praising the new coach. Two weeks yes. ago, you said the new coach was just as bad as the old coach. I wanted one him fired. for another man. Look at you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I'll let you handle Chicago. I'm going to talk about New England and what comes out of this game for New England. And, and I'm going to sound the same note over and over and over again. Because there's going to be a controversy in New England whether they play Mac Jones or whether they play Bailey Zappi. And this misses the point. The point isn't who's better between those two quarterbacks. The point is you can't replace Tom Brady. People can sit here and tell me from now till next year what a great coach Bill Belichick is. And he is a great coach. But Tom Brady doesn't grow on trees. You can't pluck him like fruit. He's not renewable. For 20 years, he was great. Now they tried Cam Newton. They tried Mac Jones. They're going to try Bailey Zappi. That when you have a great quarterback in this league, you can be somebody. And when you don't, it's difficult. I mean, and, and it shouldn't be hard to bench Mac Jones if you want to. This is not like benching Drew Bledsoe, who led them to a Super Bowl at one point. Mac Jones has been here for a year and a half, and he's 11 and 10 as a starter. You know, he has no footprint yet in New England. They're, they're, no. they're searching for a quarterback, Mike. They they're are searching. Talking, I would just point this out to you. Joe Montana, who some of us still believe might be in the conversation for greatest quarterback of all time, the great Joe Montana. Yeah. Steve Young right. came in. He did Next. okay. That's right. Huh? That's all the right. one. So it's been Mike, done. That's the one exception to the rule. That's the one exception to the rule. Yeah, it took Most a while of the time to it's find not Roethlisberger. Well, you could say Favre and Rodgers. Favre and Rodgers. But, Favre and Rodgers. But not it Mac happens. Jones and Bailey Zappi, okay? Not them. <laughs> not last night. Not yet. Oh, that was so thrilling for me last <laughs> night. I was totally not expecting that. I apologize for wanting to fire everybody here in Chicago a week ago. And the Bulls just mashed the Celtics, too. It was a great right, night. get off Chicago. Chicago yeah, over New on. England, over I-95. You take that, too. You eat let's that. Let's move on. Yeah. Let's move to baseball, where Mark Feinsand of MLB.com says sources are telling him the Dodgers could become serious players for soon-to-be free agent Aaron Judge. The Dodgers could free up payroll by cutting ties with Justin Turner, Trey Turner, Joey Gallo, Craig Kimbrell, and they could move Mookie Betts from right field to second base, where he has played seven games this season. He played second base before in his career. Tony, how yeah, seriously yeah. do you take the Dodgers as suitors for Aaron Judge? Okay, let me just first say I know Mark Feinstein. I have him on my podcast a lot. I like him a lot. 
uh, how seriously do I take them? Very This is Los Angeles yeah. Dodgers. They yeah. have as much money as the New York Yankees. The New York Yankees are the number one team in the history of baseball. But on the second line, there's some space, but on the second line are the Dodgers, the Cardinals, the Red Sox. The Aaron Judge grew up in California, Northern California, not Southern California. But California, you can add two and two and get four. I don't know if Aaron Judge wants to leave New York City, but a great place for a star to land, if he does, is Los Angeles, California. And the great convenience of this, you mentioned it with Mookie Betts, because he's a great right fielder. He's an MVP. He's a World Series champion. He's a five-time gold glove. You don't move Mookie Betts out of right field, except he's willing to move. He came up as a second baseman, so Aaron Judge could go there. And then you think the Yankees have a good lineup? Do they have four MVPs? If you have Betts and Judge and Bellinger and Freddie Freeman? I mean, are you kidding me with this? So I, th I think they would be players if indeed Judge was willing. Because if the players. Yankees, if he wants to stay, he stays. The so. players, the, the, the Dodgers are in it for anybody they want. Freddie Freeman is a, is, is a prime example of that. I mean, they had to go get Freddie Freeman, and they did. They, 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 they seem yeah. to have no hesitance at all to go after the big. Tony, they've replaced the Yankees in that way. They now, or at least they're neck and neck, even if they haven't fully replaced them. No, you're right. They go after right. the biggest stars. Like when the Yankees said, we want Reggie Jackson. Fine, they got Reggie Jackson. So the Dodgers do that now. No, who would, like, you'd be crazy to doubt, given what the Dodgers have done in recent years, you'd be That's crazy right. to doubt that they would go and try and get Aaron Judge. The Yankees keep people they want to keep. If he wants to stay, they will keep him. If not, good place to land. The San Antonio Spurs beat Minnesota last night. The Spurs are now 3-1 and one with wins at Philadelphia and at Minnesota, I believe playoff teams. The Spurs didn't figure to be 3-1. and one. They figured to be 3-11 and 11 or 3-21. and 21. Most people assume the Spurs would try to lose enough games to get into the Victor Wembanyama sweepstakes. Will Bonner, the Spurs better off winning or tanking? Yeah, I don't think that those extremes are where the Spurs are going to wind up, and certainly not intentionally. And you know Greg Popovich ain't going to walk in the locker room and say, hey, guys, let's toss a couple because I'd like to coach Victor. That ain't going to happen. So I'm the only person uh, who <laughs> pays any real attention to the NBA who thinks that the whole tanking theme is overrated. And I know my buddy and colleague Woj will kill me when I see him tomorrow. He'll say, are you, have you lost your mind? No, I just think the odds are so against it and they're so slim that I don't think everybody's going to tank like everybody else who covers and observes the league will do. And, I, you know, the Spurs, they're not going to be any good. They're not going to have to tank. They just won't be any good. Same with Utah, even though they got off to a 3-1 and start. So I think this whole theme is overrated and overstated and bad teams will be in the victor sweepstakes at some point. I don't even know you anymore. This is the second time on this show that you've gone against what you used to say all the time, yeah. which was that tanking was good. You sat in that seat and said, I said tank, it's okay. Tank, tank. I said it was okay. You know, let, me, let me just explain something to people, how you go about tanking. You don't ask players to tank. Athletes don't do that. They play as hard as they can, and they play to win. Players don't tank. Organizations tank. Okay. They strip down payroll. They yep. get rid of good players. They put together a bunch of young people, and they try and get prospects and draft picks, which is exactly what it looked like San Antonio was doing with the second lowest payroll in the league in that trade they made earlier, you know, for DeJounte Murray a protected Atlanta, draft pick. Sure. So they wouldn't even get one, two, three. Yeah. But tanking the fifth team... The fifth worst team has a 10% chance of the number one pick. The first worst team has a, only a 14% 14 chance. 14% chance. The NBA chance. has tried to discourage it. They've tried to discourage it. Let's take a break. Eh. Coming up, eh. why haven't the Lakers traded Russell Westbrook already? Why don't they trade him by 7 o'clock? We'll ask Brian Windhorst. Maybe they'll start tanking the Lakers. No, they won't. They're just bad right now. We'll also ask him how Players the Nets are tank. weathering the Ben Simmons experience so far. You put together a bad team like Detroit and Oklahoma City and Pardon Saturday. the interruption is presented by the refreshing. We're just one week into the NBA season, but we already need an intelligence briefing from our great friend Brian Windhorst, who is seated at the court that he built into his home. Lovely piece of work. New Lakers coach Darvin Ham said all the right things 
about Russell Westbrook leading up to this season. Then he benched him down the stretch on Sunday night. Brian, what is holding up the Lakers from either trading Westbrook or moving Westbrook or just changing this dynamic with Westbrook? They've got to play this respect game, Tony. And, you know, the thing about it is I don't, I don't understand it initially, but as you talk to people across the league, especially players, there's a lot of respect out there for Russell Westbrook. And so the Lakers operate a brand where they always have to attract star players. And this was established during Dr. Jerry Buss's time and it's followed over to his uh, daughter, Jeannie, who now runs the team. They don't ever want to make it seem like they or mistreat star players because they're worried about keeping the ones they have and getting ones in the future. So while it may seem to everybody, like why are they giving Westbrook a ninth, 10th, 12th, 35th chance? It's because they need to make sure that they give every opportunity for him to be successful. The Lakers are good basketball people. Darvin Ham knows basketball. Rob Palenka, the GM, knows basketball. Jeannie Buss knows basketball. LeBron knows basketball. They know it's not working, but they're trying to play the long game here. So what I expect is in the next few games, three, five, eight, I don't know, you will see Russell Westbrook's role diminish because when Russell Westbrook isn't on the court, the Lakers are actually kind of okay They've had the second best defense in the league so far. And when they don't shoot atrociously and they just shoot poorly, they actually can keep their head above water. So I think you will see Westbrook's playing time come down after this nod to him and them start to stabilize. Brian, isn't it possible that there's just too much blaming of Westbrook? I mean, if they got two of the top five players on their team, which people say that, oh, Anthony Davis with healthy is one of the top five. Not that I'm buying that really. But, I mean, my God, Westbrook is dragging the whole operation down. Or is there something bigger, more fundamental to be looked at and corrected with the Lakers? You're, it's both, Michael, because they have less margin for error. So Westbrook sticks out like a sore thumb. But in all honesty, Anthony Davis has been an unacceptably poor three-point shooter for the last two years. He shot under 20% from three-point range last year. He's shooting under 20% from three-point range this year. LeBron, we know historically, is a below the Mendoza line. The Mendoza line, really, for three-point shooting in the NBA is 33%. If you shoot below that, you probably shouldn't be taking that many. Um, LeBron routinely does shoot below 33%. He has his moments. So, really, if you're building a team around Anthony Davis, you're already sort of, you know, you know going with a, a you know, a, a rock tied to your foot in today's terms about building an offense. <laughs> you put Anthony Davis in there with Russell Westbrook. Now you're at best playing with two and a half shooters if you're calling LeBron a shooter. So already they're they're at a disadvantage in today's NBA. So yeah, Russell Westbrook would be more survivable as a player out there if Anthony Davis could hit an outside shot. But overall, I think Anthony Davis is still playing well, and he's been a big part of their defensive success early on. I will right, we'll get off the Lakers because I know Tony's got Laker fatigue already. He announced that sometime around Labor Day, and I don't blame him I in do. this case. I do. But let's go to the Sixers. Let's go across the country where they finally won a game last night. Still just one and three. Brian, I've been thinking it's just a slow start, but if it's more than that, please tell us. So, Michael, um, James Harden is really happy. And the reason he's happy is because they're playing Houston Rockets style basketball again. Uh -oh. And he's uh -oh. putting up big numbers again. And he's comfortable playing that way. He's comfortable dominating the ball. He's comfortable putting up numbers. Um, but that's not the way this team was designed. That's not the way that Joel Embiid wants to play. That's not the way Tyrese Maxey wants to play. And you look at this roster, the guy who was their sixth man last year, um, Matisse Thibel, is now barely in the rotation. They have really upgraded this roster. In theory, Harden and Embiid should work well together, but they're playing throwback to Houston Rockets basketball. And I, I just don't know if that's going to work. It's going to be great for James Harden's stats. Potentially will be great for the contract that he asked for in the offseason, but it's not maximizing their roster. And that's going to come to a head. They're either going to have to get off of that and he's going to have to play more of the other players' talents, or we're going to have issues, I really think, with this team. I love their talent. I expect them to be very good, but they're not taking advantage of that whole talent right now. We'll get you out of here on this. We need a quick answer to it. It should be a quick answer. Ben Simmons fouled out for the second time in three games last night, and he doesn't score many points either. How patient do you really think the Nets are going to be with this? 
This is a massive problem. He fouled out four times in six years in Philly. He's fouled out two and three games in Brooklyn, and he fouled out in the preseason. Uh, the only thing that he can do for the Nets is be great defensively. They are absolutely atrocious, wretched, unacceptable defensively early in this season, and they cannot survive that. The reason they couldn't compete last year was because they couldn't defend. The reason that they swallowed the hardened trade was to get better on defense. If he can't be out there at, in, for more than 30 minutes, which he can't right now, he's getting a foul every five and a half minutes out there, he, it's no good. And so they got to reevaluate what they're asking him to do. He's got to reevaluate the way, the way he's playing. I know we're only a week in, but this trend is unacceptable if the Nets are going to have any chance to do something special this year. Thank you, Brian. Great to have you, you back. Brian. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it, man. Have a good week. Let's take one last break. Still to come, Tom Brady addresses the notion that he could quit during this season. And here we go. Is Serena Williams really, 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 really retired after all? Soto. After Soto declined the Washington Nationals offer of $440 million over 15 years to stay in D.C., the Nats sent Soto to San Diego with the trade deadline for a large can of beans. Soto didn't do much in San Diego, hitting only 236, six homers, 16 RBI in 52 games. But in 2019, at age 21, Soto had 34 homers and 110 RBI. In the shortened season of 2020, Soto hit 351. Very disciplined at the plate, draws a ton of walks. Soto's career on base percentage is an astounding 423. Wow. Soto will come to free agency in two more years, and most expect his contract to land in the Aaron Judge Shohei Otani stratosphere. But Tony, the on field question will remain, particularly for you and people of your ilk. Can the Nationals win without Juan Soto the way they won no. without Bryce Harper? No. You no. know this already, no. huh? You're giving no, up on your squad. Lost 300 games this year. Happy anniversary, Joe Flacco. On this day last year, Flacco was traded from the Eagles where he backed up Jalen Hurts to the Jets to back up Zach Wilson. Flacco won the Super Bowl in 2012 with Baltimore, was the MVP of that game. At the time, he was considered nearly elite. By 2019, Flacco lost out to Lamar Jackson, traded to Denver where he started eight games. Next year, he was on the Jets backing up Sam Darnold, which began this part of his career as an itinerant backup. It's interesting, if not unique, that at 37, Flacco seems content staying in the league as a backup after being a starter and a star. He got the ring. Now he holds the clipboard and makes a ton of money. Mama. Yes, he does. Let your kid grow up to be a backup quarterback. It's okay. Happy trails to the notion that Tom Brady might quit football. Brady addressed this issue last night on his weekly podcast with Jim Gray. Gray asked Brady if he still loved football, a question many of us have, and Brady said, quote, absolutely. At this stage we're in, you got to dig deep, see what kind of character you have, see what you believe in, and your values as a team, unquote. Gray also suggested that Brady might quit, or said it had been suggested Brady might quit by me, for example. Brady said, quote, I made a commitment to this team, and I love this team. I never quit on anything in my life. We all count on one another to be at our best and to work hard and to put the team first. That's what you commit to, and that's what you want your teammates to commit to, unquote. Well, man, it sounds like he's all in still. I sure it does, Tony. I, I just don't. I'm at the first, for the first time in my life watching Tom Brady, I just don't feel like there's anything that's really going to be there. By the time we get to yeah. the meat of the season in December and into January, I just don't feel that way. Now, look. God knows he's capable of making all of us who feel that way look stupid. He is, and he might. But right now, eh. One omission. I mentioned the Dodgers lineup would have four MVPs if they get Aaron Judge. They'd have five on the team if you count, count Clayton Kershaw, because Judge has to actually win the award, which he will. Let's go quick to the big finish. Let's Ryan Williamson will miss tonight's game against the Mavs with a hip contusion. Really? Cause for concern? His fall out of the air after dunking was cause for concern. If he only misses one game or two games or five games, it's going to be all right. The Jets traded a sixth-round pick to the Jags for running back James Robinson. Is that significant? Is he Brees Hall? He's out. He was good. Bulls came from 19 down to beat the Celtics by 18. Is that significant? Yeah, because four quarters against Cleveland and then one quarter against Boston, it looked like the Bulls were tanking. And they shouldn't be, but they came back. They showed they had some guts last night. 
Serena told attendees of TechCrunch last week she is not retired. You surprised? No, she hasn't said she's retired yet. If you want to play, play. It's okay. It's okay. Last one. Phil Kessel tied the NHL Ironman record last night. Will he break it tonight? Iron Man means you don't guess from day to day. Yeah, he'll break it. Of course he will. Yeah. We're out of time. Trying to do better the next time, and I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. As they would say,